Stopping Our Movement. If you've been a part of our summits before, thank you for coming back. And if you're new to our summits, welcome. Um, the summits was basically a reaction to the pandemic that we were in. We weren't able to do our live shows and our live performances. So it really was just a way of us still connecting with our people in a way that made sense to us that was still for our people and by our people. And so we wanted to always have topics that matter to us, be it uh, beauty and mental health or just surviving through the COVID uh, pandemic or remote learning for our parents. Just what we wanted to do every month on tackling topics that meant something to us. So this month, um, right on time of Black History Month, we wanted to start our uh, summit with uh, the topic of buying Black and what that means to us, what that means to our people, what that means uh, for our children and our children's children and, and the importance of that and what we, what we see for ourselves and what we see for our community. So we have two amazing guests today that I want to introduce you all to. Um, before we begin, I will say that if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can always put them in the chat box and we'll review the chat and make sure that we get all your questions or your comments, anything that you have for the guests. And then at some point, I definitely will um, allow you to unmute yourself and then you can speak to the guests yourselves. Um, if you have anything you want to ask them about their brands, what they're doing, and all that good stuff. So today we have our first guest is Dr. Aisha Z. Court. She's a first-generation Cuban Guyanese American born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. She's an entrepreneur who runs a few businesses, including Hey Dr. Court, Viva La, La Lengua, Travel, and Vela Negra. Through Hey Dr. Court, she runs the Viva La, La Lengua Spanish language courses and cultural, cultural immersion tours in Havana, Cuba, and Mexico, to name a few places. Uh, Vela Negra is her latest ba uh, business baby and most personal. Vela Negra is a line of black waxed vegan coconut soil candles. The signature fragrance, ash, azúcar, coqui, morena, rico, WEPA are, are inspired by various elements of her Afro-Cuban and Guyanese heritage. Each candle is individually hand poured using 100% vegan coconut soy wax and eth ethnically sourced woods, wood wicks, fragrance and dyes to provide a luxurious and environmentally conscious clean burn. She's a full-time lecturer uh, of Spanish at Howard University and is also a full-time lecturer of Spanish at UCLA. She's earned her bachelor's in, in Spanish from Yale University and her MA and PhD in Spanish literature from Emory University. Welcome. <laughs> Together, thank you for having me. Very excited about this conversation today. Um, so I think we're gonna have a great time. I'm excited. Yes. Sonia. Yes, yes, yes. And next we have Sonia Smith Khan, who is a multi multicultural advocate who draws from her diverse cultural heritage as an Afro Latina, a proud military brat born on Puerto Rico, then stationed in Hawaii's island of Oahu. She is founder and designer of Mixed Up Clothing, a children's lifestyle and a power brand that showcases cultures of the world. Her and her designs have been featured on the Today Show, The Real, NPR, Medium, and Latina Magazine. Sonia is co-founder of Corturas, a medium platform and marketplace. She co she's co-founder of Multiculture Corner, a community for multiracial people and families for social educational and celebratory news and events. As a co-founder of Mixed Heritage Day, she was recognized by LA's Mayor Garcetti at Dodger Stadium for the work she has done in the community. A multiracial activist and community leader, Sonia serves as president of Multiracial Americas of Southern California, a 501c3. 
Today, Sonia calls Los Angeles home, where she is married to her Korean husband and mama of four multicultural, multiracial, and multi multilingual children. Hi, hi. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Welcome, ladies. <laughs> thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, I really, I really, really love your brands. So I feel like it was so important to um, really discuss what it meant uh, buying Black and what that means for us. And so what do you feel like? It, why is it so important to buy Black? did you want to or I can go. I don't know. well for for me uh thank you thank you um uh dr court i think it's important that we you know it's about closing the racial wealth gap right i think just on the like first level um i think that's what's really important is that you know um uh there's a we need to give money and bring money back to the community and i think when we're intentional about uh, our dollars and making sure that they go into the black community black business black creatives um that helps us bring back money into our communities mm -hmm. i totally agree um i think also in terms of buying black you help to create an infrastructure in which you can continue to do so not just doing one drop purchases but once you start seeing that there are more options within your community and by putting that money into the community, as you say, um, you start to create even more opportunities and it snowballs and avalanches. And then it kind of leads to a mindset shift where we understand that, hey, it's not just buying black because I think sometimes we think of it as this unattainable thing or it's something that's over here on the other side. Once you start shifting and saying like, I can get toilet paper from a black vendor. I can do business with black vendors. I can, I can find black toothpaste. I don't have to go to Crest or Colgate. Um, I think it is that snowball effect, just starting with the one movement and then keeping it moving. Buying black is, is a total mind shift when you're really intentional about it, as you say, yeah. And if I could just, there was one other piece as I saw two of my kids walk by, um, it also tell, brings something to them as well, right? Our children so that they see that there are, you know, uh, folks in the in black community that are doing something so they get inspired. So I feel like it is also that trickle down effect where if you can see it, you can be it. And I think that's also part of not only the financial piece, but the empowerment piece that uh, our children get to see. So generational. And we hear a lot about that, right? We hear about like creating generational wealth and brand legacy and what those things mean. What do they mean? What in either one of you can answer or both? What do you what do you feel like they mean to you? Generational wealth and brand legacy. Um, I would say for me, I don't have kids yet, but definitely being first generation, it's how do you build on what was instilled in you? So maybe I, I know my parents' story, like my mother came with. $50 in a dress. That was it. My dad had $100 and he landed on his brother's doorstep. He was going to school. So how do you build from that? Like we, we get these degrees and they're great, but now it's how do we create something that lasts beyond us? So financial literacy, I think is huge. And we're starting to see a lot of movements within the black community and beyond just educating students from a very, very young age that it's not just about getting a job, it's putting your money to work once you make it, right? So some of the reasons I know for me, at least why I do many different things is I like to diversify and I'm thinking, okay, well, how can I do this? Maybe I'm gonna do the grind for two or three years, but I want my money to work for me. When I go to invest in understanding investment, like we, we're, we're behind in this country, at least when it comes to that, um, and please feel free to jump in at any time, Sonia, if I start rambling, I tend to do this because I get really <laughs> amped about financial literacy and it gets me excited because there is money everywhere, but we just don't understand it. We'll work ourselves to the bone because we're taught that hard work gets you results. And it does, but if you are trying to leave a legacy, we, we sometimes we don't even talk about life insurance, mm -hmm. right, in our families life insurance, um, family planning, having a will in place. 
talking about trust and things like that. These are conversations that typically culturally we may shy away from. And I think we're a generation now and we're seeing it in the younger kids too. They are talking about it openly because there's so much access and that gets me excited for even like my sisters have kids and I become that rich auntie. I want to, you know, talk to them about, okay, I'm going to put aside a hundred dollars a month for you in this brokerage account, not even in a 529, but in a brokerage account and watch that grow. Let your mom be the guardian and see that. That's a whole, that's a shift from when my parents were buying bonds for people. And that was a big deal. People were like, why don't you just give them money? It's like, the bond is worth more. So that I think is, is huge. Just getting our minds and getting educated at whatever age and wherever we're at about financial literacy, what we can do with what we have, how we can put our money to work to make more money for us so that we're not killing ourselves and not being able to leave something behind for the next generation to build on and grow. Mm -hmm. Very true, very, very true. Um, what do you feel, so when we talk about um, generational wealth and we talk about brand legacy and creating something that you know, we can be proud of culturally. One thing I will say is that anyone can, you know, when you want to create a business, you create a business, whether it's baking or, you know, someone wanted to start a bank or whatever it is. There's someone who it starts with a thought. You start with a thought, you think of creating this business and you you take it from there. One thing I can say I appreciate and I and I myself can relate and I think that's where um, my love for what you ladies do is is that you chose to not just create a business and monetize it but you chose to create something that you became of service to right you're you're giving a service in the sense of you became about your culture now it wasn't just about creating this thing where, you know, and we all could do that. We all could create something and make money off of it. Um, you know, you take the time out and you build a business and that's it. But I appreciate the fact that you chose to make a business that you be, you were also in service to your community. You're in service to your culture. And to me, that that is so much more meaningful because now you're putting your money where your mouth is. You're doing something and giving back to your people. And for me, obviously, that's the basis behind what I do. You know, it, it's, it's almost like it becomes your calling where it's bigger than just you. And it's not just about what you're doing, but it's about what you're doing for your people. Um, what, what made you do that? What, what inspired you to then say, you know, I'm not just going to make a couple of dollars off of this. This is bigger than me. Um, for me, I was actually, I went to school to be a registered nurse. I was in critical care for 15 years. I, you know, I, uh, I, I, that's what I went to school for. That's what I uh, enjoyed. And, you know, I just kept thinking as I was having my children, I was thinking, so I had my father who's black, mom, Mexican, married to my husband who's Korean. And I'm having these little mixy kids running around the house. And I was trying to figure out, you know, how can I help them see themselves, right? And so I was doing it in the hospital setting. I was, you know, that cult multicultural nurse in a hospital setting. I was, I loved listening to people and talk about their culture and their background and, um, um, and you know, whether they needed a prayer rug uh, or needed their bed turned towards Mecca, whatever it was, I was, I was like, yes, if it helps at that intersection of health and, and identity and, and um, you know, get you to, to your better place, that's what I wanted to do. But as I was having my children, I started, you know, figuring out I really wanted to be intentional. Um, when I came from Hawaii to California, I didn't see anybody who looked like me. I, you know, in the land of um, blonde hair and blue eyes with feathers, I was like opposite that. My hair didn't work. Uh, my, you know, my mom didn't know how to do my hair. There was this whole, I mean, there was just things and I wanted it better for my children. So what I had set out to do was to make sure that I call it culture proofing my home and where, you know, you, the, you child proof your home to make sure your kids don't get injured 
I culture proof so that their identity is not injured. So I make sure that they have artwork that looks like them. I make sure that there's uh, books with characters that are black and brown and Asian and, you know, this whole thing. I make sure that, you know, the videos we watch, the, I mean, everything is intentional. And one thing that I noticed was in fashion, there wasn't anything that I felt um, I could put on them that reflected who we were. So it started off very to my family. So I had been sewing since seventh grade. Uh, we're, we're here in LA. I went to the garment district. I started, started sourcing fabric from all over the world. And I sewed them into fun, you know, dresses, shorts, tops, whatever, this whole thing. And then people were putting in orders. They were doing, you know, and all of a sudden my husband was like, what are you doing? And I said, I think I'm starting a business. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, it was like, you know, how can I make a difference for children that look like mine, that, that want to see themselves reflected? And so we started putting Hola, you know, this was like 10 years ago before, you know, the, the target started thinking that it was cute to put, you know, little things that just, you know, sprinkle here and there. Um, we were doing it like I would. Uh, and to bring it back, I was making sure that, you know, my uh, Senegalese uh, seamstress was, you know, also part of the process or that, you know, the, the fabric had a story of the maker and the, and so we, everything had an educational piece. Girl, I forgot the question, but you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> All of that to say, the mindset was really about changing, I'm, I'm gonna say it like changing society. Like it was really that big was the dream. And then kind of peeling that back and saying, well, maybe not, okay. So let's go with the community. Let's go with my family. Let's go with, and then as it kept growing and people were like, oh, there is something to this having black and brown, um, you know, designers and models and uh, different hair textures on the runway. Okay. And so it is changing. Absolutely. What about you, Aisha? Um, you kept saying the word intention, and I was like, that's, that's why we do it. I don't do anything arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. Everything is deliberate. Everything is intentional. With Hey Dr. Court, I thought about myself as a language learner and as a teacher. And what I've seen teaching little kids in second grade, teaching high schoolers, teaching college university students. And I thought about one, what is the kind, how would I want to learn language as an adult? I would want to first somebody to understand, help me understand who I am as a learner, have a system that was flexible because you're working, you're going to school, you're doing X, Y, Z and the other, have something that wasn't so rigid, 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 I can speak English, rigid, um, <laughs> um, something that allowed me to really explore and fall down the rabbit hole and find out where my strengths and weaknesses were. And then also on the flip side, as a language learner, um, I knew that there were a lot of heritage speakers and a lot of adults who grew up hearing Spanish at home, who either spoke it, spoke broken Spanish, didn't speak Spanish, but wanted to learn Spanish. And how do you reach those people and create a program that worked for them? So with Hey Dr. Court, that was kind of the, the impetus and the intention undergirding that and building that and then with images I'm very intentional about images I, I usually just put black people on my pages on whatever I can control because again you don't see people associating Spanish and language learning with blackness and that's crazy to me because I grew up in a community in Boston whatever people want to say about Boston Boston is very diverse if you live in Boston you're from Boston where it's Caribbeans, um, people from Central America, South America, speaking many different languages. We have the largest diaspora, Cape Verdean diaspora in 
the world in the country in Boston and Providence. So that's one, like, you know, I've always been around different languages. Um, so I want to be very intentional with images in terms of the trips with Viva La Lengua Travel. I wanted to design a cultural immersion tour or tours that were accessible to adults that would give that balance of, yes, it's educational and you're gonna do the course before, but you also wanna see what's going on in this country, but you also have a job. So I can't keep you in this country for two, three months, but what can I do with you in the month of classes, the four weeks of classes that we have before online, plus the five, six days in country that we do that makes this worthwhile, that makes you wanna come back, that makes you confident enough to want to keep going and explore this further and put your skills to use. So all of that is intentional and then choosing vendors and spaces and activities that, because most of my clients are black, I think, yeah, I think in the, the years that I've had, Hey Dr. Court, maybe had two or three um, non-black people join the programs um, just because they see a black teacher and one of the things that they're like, oh, somebody who looks like me, they, they're, they're gonna get this and seeing that connection. Um, with Vela Negra, it's blackity black, black, black. It's a black, um, black vessels, black wax, black candles. When we talk about ashe, when we talk about azúcar, when we talk about morena, morena is a, a nickname, you know, like nobody in my family calls me negra, they call me morena, right? It is, if I could put blackness into scent and heritage into scent, that is what Bella Negra is, right? Everything that's coming, I, again, didn't want to have people keep this negative association with blackness. Like usually see candles, they're white, sometimes they're different colors, but usually they're just white and maybe the vessel is something different, but black is so beautiful and it is such a powerful color. When you go to burn a black candle, some people have that negative association. No, you burn a black candle to dispel negative energy. That's the beauty of blackness. Like we light it all up right? And we clear out things for you. So I wanted to make sure that that was very clear from the start. Um, even collaborations that I've done, it's like, I do my candles in black wax. So we're going to start there. <laughs> if you want to do something completely separate, white label with your stuff, that's fine. But if it's Vela Negra plus somebody else or by somebody else, it's going to be black wax. That's something that I've been very deliberate about. And again, imaging as well, and colors and messages and collaborations like this and getting on platforms, being able to talk about stuff with black businesses, um, giveaways with black businesses, that's, that is very, very important to me because there are black candle makers, there are black candle brands, um, but Afro Latino, like it's not that many, you know? So making that upfront, when I say Afro, I mean black, right? Like, so there's no kind of confusion. We all know where we're starting from. Okay, great, let's go from there. Um, but intention, intention, intention. I love that you kept saying that, Sonia. It, that is at the core of everything. Nothing is by chance. Nothing is just a fluke like or a Hail Mary, like let's see if this works. Everything is intentional. I also heard being, I also heard from there, if I may, that um, it's, it's unapologetic, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's also what is beautiful about this time is that for me, I was so um, like my, my language was, you know, in my, our household, my grandparents, I lived with my grandparents. They were like, you will learn English. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and because they wanted to assimilate. And now there's this turning of ground of, you know, I am black and I am, I can speak, you know, and I speak Spanish and language is such an integral part of identity and we're reclaiming that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the message of also with buying black is that now it's our turn, right? Now we can come back to, you You know, we, we've been oppressed for so long that now it's like, no, I am unapologetic about it. And I am going to, you know, be that change. And I think it's important to be change agents. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think that because they're so in your journey of creating your businesses, were there any, even though there's, like you said, there's so few of us, 
were there any um, other businesses that mentored you or that inspired you to kind of burn the flame of what you needed to do? Um, maybe not exactly the same line of business, whether it wasn't clothing or it wasn't candles or language, but you saw other people doing for the culture and it made you want to keep that momentum going. Well, for me, I went to, um, <laughs> Uh, I went to work with Macy's um, and they had a diversity initiative and um, it was nothing but black founders who it's called the workshop at Macy's. Um, I think uh, if they didn't close applications, um, they're usually around this time, um, but they not. So when I was there, it was uh, Lisa Price, who was one of the mentors there and she was my first purchase. She, you know, and so she has stayed in touch. And I think there's really just because there are, there was so few of us um, that I think, you know, she, she was, and Macy's was instrumental in helping me get um, my standing. And right now I think there's, um, there's a company, a hair care line called Mixed Chicks that definitely has helped me as well with branding and marketing and, and really feeling like, I can, um, you know, tell my story in an authentic way, and 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 share that. So I think definitely finding mentors um, has been the best thing for me to help get to the next level of my business. I wish I had mentors. I, had mentors. Um, <laughs> I am looking for mentors. So if you know anybody, send them my way. Um, I think for me, it's, especially starting out when I first started with Hey Dr. Court, there was a lot of trial and error. Um, I remember doing a workshop, um, it was like a two day workshop with Rent the Runway. They had something called Project Entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And that helped me see like big picture, not just, oh, I wanna, I wanna teach language and I wanna take people to countries. It's like, no, how do you make this bigger? Like you say, make it last generational. Um, and it's really been from there and connecting with people at that and peers. Um, so bouncing ideas off of each other, even if we're not in the same field. Like I see one of my friends on here. She has an amazing podcast, Figure Out Your Life. Um, we're not in the same field, but sometimes we'll bounce things off of each other or a question will come up. And because she's outside of what I do, it's a different perspective and vice versa. You know, whether it is marketing or how did you create that meme or Oh, okay, I really like that merch. Like, let me go buy your shirt. Um, I found that it's a lot of peer to peer, um, but I am looking for mentors. I would love to have somebody who is established, who, again, not even in the same field or fields, but who can say, hey, you may want to look at this, or as you're getting ready to build or build up to a release, or you want to go bigger or scale. These are some things to take in mind because you can read a lot of articles and glean some information, but if you're you're all kind of in the same place, it's really hard to to get that perspective and that knowledge. And I love mentors, like I, mean, I really do. So I'm hoping to find one soon. No, and it's true, like you said, to have peers that you can bounce ideas off of because as a community, even if we all have different businesses we could all learn from each other or at least help each other. Um, you know, Sonia, we were talking about this last night about the crabs in the barrel idea of just feeling like there's only space for me and I can't help anybody else and I gotta just do my thing and screw you. And it doesn't, it doesn't help us. I think that, I think there's that fear of there's not enough room for us. So I gotta, I gotta be out for self. But the reality is, is that we can make that room. We can create those lanes. And despite what, you know, others think or feel, if we can just be there for each other and say, like you said, um, Aisha, just bouncing ideas off of each other, even if we don't have the same business and helping each other, even it could be completely different, but business kind of is the same in the sense of how do we propel in this way? How do we move the business forward? And I think that's, that's, that's the key in, in us just propelling our businesses to that point. Um, what were some positive things that you've received with your business, but also too, what were some negative, if you received any negative pushback? Um, I will say 
there's been a generally positive response to um, Hey Dr. Cora, Viva La Lingua Travel because of the Black travel movement and it being another niche that people can tap into. Um, with Vela Negra, very positive, especially we were featured on Good Morning America in October and that was huge boost. Um, but then that brought the negative that I hadn't dealt with yet. Um, ah! that. Um, only because the volume was so much that we got and I, I, I'm one person, right? So I do them myself all from start to finish. Um, even sending out emails like, hey guys, now we have some COVID delays. Hey mm. guys, USPS is having delivery delays. Um, people just being very, uh, um, got called out of my name a few times, had to block some people. <coughs> um, <laughs> just because U USPS delays, um, then having further delays with shipping and stuff, even as you're trying to be transparent with people. Um, many people think that because you exist or because your business is featured on certain platforms that you're ready to take volume. And that's not always the case sometimes. Well, for me, at least, and I've seen other people talk about this, that showcase that big platform that you get is your first time there. And even though I had started buying more vessels, I had no idea, <laughs> no idea what was coming my way. So when the orders, the first 10, I was like, oh, that's so cool. And then they just kept coming. And I was like, oh shit, <laughs> um, how, I was like, I have to make all these. Like the excitement went to like fear to like, I got a full-time job, <laughs> I don't know, right? Um, but still putting that out and trying to be clear with people and managing expectations, I think for me was really hard. And then having to reframe the systems that I thought I had in place to deal with the volume that I had previous to then, but now it's picked up and how do you pivot? How do you shift? How do you rearrange things? Do you call in reinforcements? <laughs> um, do you set up your time differently so that you can get it all done? Um, that was a big lesson for me. Definitely. You're up now. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Giovanni has said the point of the black dollar is so important because one of the biggest not so much a secret is from other communities like the Jewish community, which is exactly the same model for thriving and succeeding. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Very good point. Um, what about you, Sonia? Any any positive or negative like pushback you received? Uh, no, I think it's been a uh like throughout my my time or just <laughs> or is it, I mean like um no I think it's been overwhelming um the support I think now uh you know folks are actually returning my emails uh folks are now you know saying hey uh there's actually a spot we're opening it up for you know black and brown uh founders can you present your brand so you know I, I do, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, now you want to listen, right? But then I, there I am sending my stuff, showing the photos and doing all that. Uh, so it's definitely been a great time to start a business um, and also to, to really think about what it is that moves you and what it is that is your calling or your mission. Um, and figuring that out. I think right now um, with everything that is going on, it's, it's living your truth and figuring out how do I make money doing that at the same time. And so I think there's, there's that. And I think that's been one of the best things uh, that I've heard about having a business. If someone can look at me and say, um, there she is living her truth and how can I do the same? Um, I think that has been one of the biggest compliments um, for, for me. I think uh, one of the challenges that I faced is, um, you know, having to give space or knowing when to give space, uh, using my, my, I guess, um, you know, if they're at, I'm just going to be real. I think when they say black founders, am I black enough? And I think, you know, you know, if they're asking, I had Univision uh, ask me, 
to send some of our, you know, teas that I have in the background and I'm like, am I Latina enough? You know, so I think if, if I had to be really honest, um, it is feeling enough and, and to hold space in some of these communities. Um, even when you reached out, Crystal, I was like, Black Summit, okay, how am I gonna, you know, where do I fit? Am I Afro-Latina enough? Am I black skin? Like who, you know, so, so I think that's, that's the voice I sometimes hear. And that's been the voice that was told to me for years, you know, I have, my last name is Smith, but I speak Spanish. And I was in these, you know, predominantly Hispanic schools, but I was, you know, but I'm black and bub, bub, bub. And my father would come and then everybody would be confused, you know? And so it is really just kind of trying to tune out some of the voices that are self-inflicted at times, but really just kind of saying, just stick to what your message is and what um, sharing of diverse cultures looks like. Absolutely. And sometimes we do it to ourselves. And, and a lot of times too, we, we do it to each other. That's the reality of the situation. Sometimes we put each other in those kind of boxes or those categories that <clears throat> it's not fair, but we'll, we'll then be enemies to each other. Um, and I think that the whole point of you know, buying black and pushing black is to take our, our buying power and to show that we have it. Our, our, our dollar is so powerful. When you think of the Latino dollar, you think of the black dollar, you think of when you put all these together, it's billions, trillions of dollars. When you think about the clothing industry, the hair industry, all these different industries that we have put so money, so much money into, it really propels what we can do if we then take over these these industries um what do you where do you see well before i say where do you see your brand next i want to know what is like a highlight like such a big highlight for you in both your brands uh well like something that happened that was like you knew at this point once it happens for you that there was no stopping like this was like a, a huge highlight for your for your for your brand yeah for me it's working with um you know getting the attention of we're working with macy's and target um and and i think for me i was like wow this this is what i've been waiting for for you know going on 10 years um and so i think that's exciting it's, <coughs> it's really just about um, you know, getting them, you know, getting folks to see that the diaspora, I think it, you know, of, from the Latino community and the African American community that there, you know, are shades of, of that. And, and I think that for me is also important is that I will tell our story, you know, my story. And I think that's, um, that's been a highlight. And um, so I'm excited to see see that happening. Um, and just to go back to you, uh, Dr. Cord, I think it's important that you see, you know, when you're working with uh, um, that they're they're doing online now, like yeah. everything, like Macy's online, you know, Target online, mm -hmm. that that could be an opportunity uh, for for your your candles and all those things, I think it's really amazing because they're looking now. They are looking for us, yeah. and so I think right now we need to, you know, Hollywood here, you know, is like trying to green light programming that are are centering our stories, and 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 so I think it, if you have something, just work on it, get it out there, and um, you know say yes and figure it out after. <laughs> I like that. I would do, I do that sometimes. I'm just like, I don't know how this is gonna happen. It's gonna work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, to answer your question, I'd say a highlight, I, I'll share for the two different businesses for Hey Dr. Court. Um, after my first, first group trip to Havana, I've been going to Cuba since I was 13, but I'd never officially brought a group down um, one of my students, clients, 
she was first generation. Her father left Cuba around the same time as my mom, but he did not want her to go back. He was very much against it, but he trusted me. Right. So one of the things that happened during the trip, I let them go out on their own. Like I show you the bus route. I show you how to grab a cab. I show you how to catch an American cab versus a Cuban cab, show you the money, figure it out. Right. She went, she figured it out, found her way to the beach, found her way to the store, like a little scavenger hunt around Havana, came back. We got back to the US. Two months later, she went back to Havana by herself. And I, I, I don't know how to put that into words, but her father was open to it. He realized that she had to learn and know Cuba for herself. And that was huge because that's really hard for, um, people of that generation to do for their kids, right? Because you have your own ideas about Cuba and what it is and what it's been. But the generation that's born here, we know Cuba through your stories unless we go on our own, right? So that was beautiful. This is, that was like a highlight. Um, then for Vela Negra, good morning, America, because it came out on my birthday. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so great. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, happy birthday to me. Um, but we're still growing and just getting started. And I'm very excited about what's coming next. But one of the things that you said that also, like I thought about, uh, Sonia, was the idea that the people who had said no before, when I was sending out cold emails, doing cold calls, now without me even asking, somebody will send me a feature. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> literally that same writer ignored my email, right? <laughs> or didn't pick up my call. So that's, that's kind of cool to see. Um, I'm interested to see how that grows and what comes of that. But um, yeah, that's uh, those are my highlights so far. So now ladies, where are you with your brands? Like what's the future for your brand? Where do you see it? Where is it going? What's, what's the next, what's the plan for the next? one to five years yeah for me it's just growing in in these retailers um and it's um you know figuring out how to um keep the production side and and you know fulfilling all the the orders and and now it's really um figuring out how to scale so we're at the scale part and so I, I hope to see more, more, um, more of mixed up clothing and more retailers. Um, yes, it is a good problem to have. Yes. Um, for me with Hey Dr. Court and Viva La Lengua Travel with COVID, everything was kind of shut down. Um, so I didn't do any trips last year. Everything got rescheduled to this year. Um, so I've spent this time reconfiguring how we do trips and still pendiente, as they say, about what could happen or what could not happen. So still open to the idea that maybe we can't do trips this year, or if we do it, it's going to look different. Um, we still have Cuba on the docket, and we have Tulum on the docket. Uh, for both of those, staying in constant contact with vendors as we get closer to like that no return, point of no return, are we going to have two different houses? Are we going to be working on a different side of Tulum that's away from the coast or if we're working in Havana? Are we also gonna to go to Matanzas, which is a bit further out, right? How do we reconfigure that? How do we provide more courses? How do I duplicate myself for the one-on-ones, for the group courses? With Vela Negra, um, similar because it's grown so fast. Um, I'm really focused now on building the proper team and the right team um, and how to scale in a way that is manageable for me because I do still love teaching and I teach at two different schools right now. So I don't want to totally give that up. And I think you can do all the things that you love as long as you have your time allocated properly. So try <coughs> to how to do that. And I think the team is a big part. Um, I see a question. We don't only go to Cuba. Um, on a regular year, <laughs> we go to Oaxaca, Mexico, we go to Havana, Cuba, we go to Barcelona, Spain, and then we go to Tulum, Mexico. So different varying degrees of language immersion. Tulum is the more party, like 
yeah, you want to learn Spanish, but you want to go to Tulum. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oaxaca is, we are partnered with the university down in Oaxaca. Um, we start in Oaxaca City, and then we go to the Afro Oaxacan coast, and we split our time between the two. Havana is like the middle ground, and uh, Barcelona is also a middle ground. So you do get the language exposure, but also the tourism aspect of it in both Havana and Barcelona. But this year, um, just because of the restrictions that are in place, um, I cut it down this year to Havana and Tulu. Okay. So ladies, before I open it up uh, for the Q&A, um, is there anything else you wanted to touch on or you wanted to talk about um, in regards to buying Black and the importance of, of buying Black in our community? Um, I would just say it's easier now more than ever. Um, there are listicles, there are directories, there are all sorts of things that you can have access to and you can start small. It's not so much that you need to do a complete overhaul, but if you're going to order food on Uber Eats, choose from a black owned restaurant. If you are going to order earrings or you feel like doing some online shopping, try to find a black owned business to support. If your friends have small businesses, support them. You know, that's a lot of times we don't even do that. We don't start at home. We, we think we want to and like we'll hype them up or maybe it's that you can't, as I say that, maybe you can't support with dollars, but sharing your friends pages, um, their promotions and things that they have going on is really, 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 really helpful to small businesses. If you can connect people, connecting people, you never know. Maybe it's not the right connection for you, but oh, I know somebody who's talking about that. You guys should meet. And even if it's an email introduction, things like that, just passing it forward, spread, what is it called? Paying it forward, <laughs> I think is really, um, really impactful and really helpful. Very true. For me, it's uh, definitely, um, you know, I think those are great points. And I think for me, it's really about sending the elevator back down and, um, you know, coming for your folks and, and helping however you can. So, um, uh, I love a cold email where someone has said, look, I see your page. Can you answer this for me? Or, you know, yes, here you go. Um, but I also think if you are doing, you know, cold emails like that, that you're also trying to be of service as well. There's a ask and a, and a give. Um, so I think there's definitely that part. So, um, really trying to, live the, the the way that you and treat others the way you'd like to be treated and just um helping others rise as well awesome awesome so now everyone who's part of today's summit um now i'm going to open it up for anyone to ask um aisha or sonia any questions if any feedback or comments you want to give you're more than welcome to do so now. Hey guys, this is Anna. I have <laughs> I have a question uh, for Sonia. Um, I, I I think I heard you say that as part of making your clothing brand that you tr you made an effort to um, uh, like try to find uh, manufacturers and and people that are, you know, helping you with the brand, other service providers that are Black as well. So I just wanted to know if you could speak to, um, you know, how you actually try to implement that. Because, you know, I, I just um, maybe a few months ago started my t-shirt line, which is Love My Brown Skin. It's all about empowering Black women across the diaspora. I am a, obviously a, a black woman, but you know I'm pretty sure I use non-black uh, t-shirt. <laughs> you know the the manufacturers of the t-shirts are not not are not black, and the um, printers that actually print the t-shirts are not black. And I would love to expand into that and really grow the brand to really support, as you said, all of you know other black businesses that you know, so that we can help each other. Do, do you um, have any experience with that as far as your clothing brand? Yeah, for uh, here and out, uh, uh, may I ask where you're located? I'm in New Jersey. Okay, there is, um, 
yes. So there's there's a almost like a I'm a dating myself here, but there was there's a Rolodex of mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, of folks who have that are printers that are um, uh, screen you know do silk screens and all and you know do t-shirt manufacturing. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that there is so there. I think it's We Buy Black or Shop Black. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a resource and then they list underneath all their you know headings of who does what and so mm -hmm. uh so you can actually go into there um here in los angeles i work with a uh um a group called uh makers row and in there they have a list of folks who um are manufacturers who produce who fulfill who do all that that are um uh, that they, you know, they tell I'm black owned or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, but I will say, uh, I love that intention, but do not let that stop you from getting your t-shirts out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, so until then, um, yes, continue on because you are the, the, the maker, the, you know, the face right. and, um, and so definitely would, I, I applaud your effort for sure. But there are folks that, uh, and if you go to the We Buy Black or Shop Black, they do have it listed almost like a directory of, of folks. Who uh, There's also Facebook. Uh, if you're not on, um, is it Aisha's? Um, I'm trying to think um, on Facebook. She runs a wonderful Facebook for group for Black founders. And um, it talks about, uh, you just throw your question in there. Any, mm -hmm. any you know, this, and then people will be like, I do, I'm not, you know, I, I illustrate and you're like, okay. And so I think that's also helpful. Got uh, it. Okay. Drop it in there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Rosita wrote in the chat, she said, hi, Sonia, I came in a little bit later, a little late, so I don't know if this was discussed or not, but what sizes are the clothing you create? I'd love to look into your clothing line. Yeah, uh, thank you so much and welcome. I, um, our clothing goes from zero to, uh, currently zero to eight, but, uh, when we, we are working with Macy's who expands, wants us to expand to uh, size 16. So we talked about scale, right? And bandwidth and, you know, all of that ta takes money to expand because you don't get paid until like whatever their net 90 days. So all of these are upfront costs that you have to incur. Um, so we are uh, expanding to size 16. But from right now, it's zero to uh, seven. Do you have um, a website so um, to share in the chat so oh, that they can see it? Clothing.com, and I'll drop it in here as well. Okay. And then for Aisha, she says she's never traveled alone. And uh, I think what you're doing, especially being the mother of an almost 10-year-old who refuses to speak Spanish, I'll take part, uh, partial blame for that. <laughs> um, she thinks it's something he'll learn as he gets older. Um, it's interesting. One of the trips to Tulum, a couple of people were traveling alone, but then you meet this group, right, of people. And it was the most organic trips that I've ever run before. Just because of the <laughs> want to see this place you want to put your language to use and that already unites you on the front um it can be scary of course like going through customs getting on the plane especially now in the era of corona um but it's absolutely worth it because you will meet other people who are on the same wavelength as you who are there for the same goals and that uses a lot of potential abilities. um and for your son if he wants to start or if you want to start encouraging him to speak Spanish, I'd say meet him where he's at. Um, so if and I do this with my own students, <laughs> any age, I always find my students on Netflix. So if they are watching 
cartoons, if they are watching movies, if there's something that they love, if there's music that they love, if they're already watching, um, let's say the last airbender, right? You can switch the audio to Spanish. They already know the episodes they've seen every single one. Switch mm -hmm. it to Spanish, right? Or you can put the audio in Spanish with English subtitles. And then as they start to advance, and it's like, well, I'm gonna watch this episode for the hundredth time, you can <laughs> keep the audio in Spanish and put the subtitles in Spanish. Little mm -hmm. subtle things that don't feel like work, but they're learning, they're putting the language into their ear. So it's like, oh yeah, I know that word when they go down the street, they hear it, like it, it gets into you. And even with music, um, if they're already listening to hip hop, to classical music, to, I don't know, to gospel music, all of that exists in Spanish. Swap out two songs and put two songs in, in Spanish. Little tiny minor adjustments so that you don't feel like you are overloading yourself, you're studying every day because that's one thing that I think really holds people back the idea of like, I have to study. And it's like just moving about your day and communicating with people is part of the study and the practice. So that might be a, a smoother way to, to ease him into language learning. Very I love that. Can I just add as a mom of four, I am going to add all of that to, to <laughs> my list. Yes. And also I wanted to add some, because we also, uh, my kids uh, are learning Korean. They go to Korean immersion school. Um, we uh, post-its, we post, I mean, it's kind of color purple style. Remember when she put, you know, window and seal and, you know, this whole thing, that's what we do here in the house. Our <laughs> I'm looking at it right now, has a pink post-it that says, you know, refrigerator and, and Korean and refrigerador right there as well. So that everything on the mirror, the spejo, this whole thing. So they're walking around and they're like, when are we going to take these post-its down? Well, until, you know, or it's like <laughs> one, one Spanish word a day, you, you know, basura is going to be all day. Every time I say go to basura, drop <laughs> off here. You know what I mean? So I love that idea. Awesome. It makes it easier for them um, and less overwhelming because these are already stressful times and they don't need more stress. So it's like, just let's meet them where they're at, ease them into it. Anyone else? I do have a question. Um, and you ladies may have answered this already, so I apologize if I'm asking again, but I just kind of want to talk about longevity because I feel like, I don't know if it's a cultural thing or a generational thing about wanting instant gratification when it comes to starting a business. So what keep you guys like going? Like if you're not seeing the revenue that you want or the followers on social media, and it's been maybe two or three years, like what keeps you guys going to, you know, wanted to make these businesses long-term? Cause it's a struggle for me. <laughs> so, yeah. For me, it just really came down to uh, the mission. Right. And, and, and for me, you know, I've been talking about being, you know, black and being Mexican and being mixed and being, but like ever since I can remember, I've been talking about that. So I found a business that allowed me to keep talking about it because I was gonna do it anyway. And so I think that's what, um, you know, if I'm dropping things on social media, like, you know, um, during whether it's Black History Month or whatever, I'm here to educate you. Whether you buy my clothes or not, I mean, I'm hoping you do, but I'm here so that you get to see what it means, you know, to, to uplift and to share and to educate underneath I feel like I am an educator and so who happens to have a business and so when I'm on that you know I'm going to still keep doing it because I still want to get the message out and that's what keeps moving me yes I wish the 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 you know the revenue matched my my you know uh love for you know something and my, my desire to teach. I wish that balanced. But the overall, the overarching goal is to educate and to show others and to show not only my children, but the next generation of what it looks like. Um, that keeps me going. 
I would absolutely agree, definitely echo, is staying focused on the reason why you started in the first place, right? Um, the revenue is not always going to come, and sometimes it will come, but sometimes it won't. The followers aren't going to be there, but followers don't buy all the time, right? I don't have a ton of followers on Instagram by in comparison to other people who are in the same industry, but I know that what I put out is created with intention, is created with integrity. I create it with my own hands, and I'm proud of that, right? Um, maybe it'll be another year, two, three, four, five. I'm going to keep going. Now, if I get burnt out, that's a whole other story because I'm doing too much, but in terms of what I want to put into the world, what I want to add to these spaces and what we have now, I am going to keep going, you know? Um, and you do reach a point where it isn't about the revenue. It isn't about the validation. Um, it isn't about getting a feature. It's I'm doing good work. I'm creating something beautiful. I'm creating something useful. My voice is adding something useful to the conversation. And that's hard because sometimes you have to remind yourself because you do get down. If you spent a lot of time crafting this post um, for your social media and it got like 40 likes and you're like, what? <laughs> what's up with this? Like, or something that you just put up that gets like 200 and you're like, I don't understand you people. Um, <laughs> so it, it goes both ways, but it is, you have to have switch your self-talk. And this is something that I work on every day. Um, so I'm not saying this like, oh, I got to figure it out, but I'm just saying like, why are you doing this when you get discouraged? Like I haven't been able to put out stuff for two months. That's no revenue coming in from Bella Negra. because of supply shortages, because of shipping delays, and I just have to wait. So I'm literally sitting on my hands and it's like, okay, well, what else can I be doing, right? How else can you be talking about sharing why did you do this? It's not a money thing. So now the money's gone. So <laughs> what are you doing, right? We're having conversations, right? We're participating in forums. We're having other forums. We're helping students who are interested in starting their own businesses, but they don't know where to start, right? That, for me at least, that's it's helped me refocus when I started getting like stressed out, like, well, what am I going to do for this? I don't, I can't those things um, help keep me going and constantly reminding yourself that there's something bigger. There's a reason why you started this. The money is easy, right? But what else? If the money's gone, you take that away. Why do you have your t-shirt company? Why do you have your candle line? Why do you have your consulting business? You want to help people. You want to spread a message. Um, Z, can you share what your... Um company is? Yes. So right now I do interviews. I do like live interviews. Well, I've been doing it for two years. And um, so it's nothing that generates revenue per se, but um, it's basically talking with people like different artists, part of politician, local business people, and just spreading awareness. It's like getting the word out. So I have established it as an LLC um, you know, for tax purposes, because I'm buying editing software, I'm buying all those things. So, you know, so I'm just trying to figure out a way to market it and then, you know, earn business from it. But yes. So it's I have an podcast? Uh, Yes, it's like a podcast. Yes. Um, if it's a podcast, I would take a look at, um, oh God, what is that girl's name? Um, she is on Instagram. Um, I would say if you email me, I'm going to remember her name like later on this evening, but she has a course that a couple of my friends who have podcasts have taken. Um, and in terms of that, they've, it's really helped them build a solid foundation for their platform, build a solid audience and help get the word out that way. Because even what you're talking about, it sounds really, really interesting. Um, and I'm not, if there are other like challenges that you want to share, um, that you feel comfortable sharing but we can't talk about those. Oh no, just getting like sponsors and, but I mean, for me, it's not necessarily profit. It's just bringing awareness, like, bring, you know, just so if there's like, if you have your candle uh, company or t-shirt company, you can say, oh, this podcast was sponsored by 
you know, such and such and just put, but it's more bringing awareness and revenue in all honesty. But sometimes it can, to me, I'm not really focused on the money, but just trying to get um, more people to follow, to follow my podcast. So I think yeah. she has some free templates um, about how to get sponsorships and things like that as well. So we can connect afterwards and I'll, I will remember the girl's name, but yes. <laughs> Um, and I just wanted to I just wanted to add one thing about that. When I started the t-shirt line, I don't know, must have been October last year. Um, you know, it wasn't my first business. I had a um well, let me finish the first story. So I, I started the t-shirt line, I had almost no followers, and I was just like, geez, there's so many other t-shirt lines out there. How am I ever gonna compete? How am I ever gonna get to that point? And I realized on Instagram, there's a, there's a feature where you can check how long a business has been around as far as their Instagram page. And I realized some of these pages have been in business nine years, 10 years, eight years. And it's like, it's not going to happen overnight. You can't really, you know, at least, and this is the message for me, not for necessarily for anyone else, but I can't compare myself to anyone. Like I just have to run my own race and figure out what works for me and just take it day by day. I remember when I first opened my hair salon um, in probably 2014. Yeah, 2014. Um, it was the same thought, like, geez, you know, day one, month one, year one, it was like, how am I ever going to build this? I've never been in, the, um, in this business before. How am I ever going to compete? And, you know, six years later, then, you know, over time things build and, 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 you know, it, 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 it just takes time. And that's just the thing that um, I have to continue to remind <clears throat> myself that just keep working at it every single day, every single day, just keep working at it. Doors will open and doors have always opened for me if I, if you put the effort in, you don't have to worry about the immediate outcome or, you know, what's happening today. I'm not getting sales. I'm creating this beautiful website and, you know, all this marketing and all this stuff and no sales come. Just keep working at it and eventually it'll come. So that's, that's kind of what I tell myself every day. It's not even about, you know, the immediate success. It's just about putting the efforts in and the, the doors will open eventually. So. I love that. We need to get out of our own way. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, t I mentioned that I, you know, did, I was an RN for 15 years. I could, you know, do IVs closed, you know, while eating a sandwich or, you know, this world of business is no joke. And I think I, um, as someone who is older competing against, you know, fresh out of school, uh, fashion folks, um, I, I talk to my, I talk myself out of a lot of things too. I'm like, you know, here I am 40 something and I'm still trying to learn, you know, how to, you know, do, do the, the, this fashion world and this business world. And um, so I think once I get out of my own head, to your point, I think, you know, and stop comparing myself. And I think that's what we're talking about when Dr. Court says, going back to your intention and your message and your mission of why the why you do something, that's what's going to keep you from like, okay, okay, stop, you know, stop the, that voice and say, what is it that I'm here for? Um, and, and I forgot who it was, but he, oh, it was Shea Moisture. And he said, you know, he was getting all this, um, he was like a 15 year overnight success. And it, it, that stuck with me. I was like, isn't that funny? You know, he, people were like, look at him go, you know, whatever it was. And it was like, wait a second. He's like, I've been doing this for 15 years. It's just now folks are now getting to know, you know, so those kind of things um, I try to remember that, and, and also the reality be, you know, is, you know, we try to put our best foot forward on social media, but behind it all, you know, I'm sitting on, on a, a, a wood block 
in front of my, you know what I mean? Like, but the picture that you're gonna see is gonna be my kid, my, you know, 15 year old taking a photo of me looking cute. You know what I mean? Like they're not gonna see all the other stuff because of what I'm trying to present. So don't get caught up. You, you, as you said, you are running your own race and sometimes it's walking your own race, really. And it's, um, so anyway, I, I don't know, I have no point, but. <laughs> I think you made the point, like it's yeah. pretty. It's not, like we put up the pretty pictures because that's what people want to see, but my studio, I don't have a kitchen anymore, right? So my whole kitchen is covered in candle stuff. I have to get takeout because I can't cook in there, right? Um, it's messy, it's stressful, it's late nights, it's lots of coffee, it's being irritable, then having to check yourself because you have to interact with other people in your home. Um, and you can't be <laughs> cranky with them because you wanted to make this business <coughs> work, right? Um, and yeah, it gets better, but you're doing the work, you're putting in the work, that, that's what you can do right now. Um, be patient. Um, I think things like this are great because people are like, oh, I got something that may help you and little nuggets that people toss out. Like I'm picking up stuff. I have my notebook um, because I was taking notes like, oh, that's really great. I like that. Um, because you can always learn more that could be applicable to what you're doing, what you're working on now um, and that you could pass on to somebody else. Giovanni wrote in the group chat, uh, just curious, I'm interested in any of the panelists' thoughts on the Vans Shoes move to include artists, designers, to include artist designers on their shoe brand for Black History Month. I have mixed feelings about things like that um, because it's like we're Black all the other months of the year. But it's also like, well, do you say no to this platform that could potentially help you and that you could also use to help other people? Um, it's hard, because um, you know what they're doing, right? And it's like, why didn't you see us back in August? Why didn't you see us in November? Um, but I think it depends on what comes out of it. If it is just a one-time drop in the bucket, then Vans will get the continual side eye, right? We're always going to be looking at them like, okay, I see what kind of company you are. But if it's a true, um, deliberate, again, as we say, intentional initiative, you do have to start somewhere. Um, and I think there are a lot of corporations who are having a real reckoning and trying to figure out how to move forward and intentionally be inclusive and not just inclusive when it's that particular ethnicity or identity groups month. Um, so you can't, you can't push it all to the side, but you do have to go into it with eyes open, I think. Um, it's hard, it's really hard because you see it on Telemundo, you see it on Nuevis Young, as you were saying, like, it's, are you just asking for these stories and these interviews because it's Black History Month or are you going to keep this going? because you don't like it when the English speaking channels come to you in September, October, because it's mes de la herencia hispana. So how do you, I struggle with this. I, struggle. <laughs> I don't know, sorry. I, don't think I, no, I, I think those are all really great points. And I think that's the part of the consumer that needs, uh, that we, you know, we need to be we need to scrutinize companies, right? We need to be understanding, you know, what they're, what, they're trying to do and give a side eye, you know, because they they haven't um, given us reason to trust them, and so there's definite, you know, you know, hesitancy, and it's valid. And I think uh, as someone who on this end um, is is w from the from the manufacturer side, the business side, uh, when those kind of partnerships do come up. I think it's imperative that we also speak to that point and ask, you know, can I see who's on your board? Can I, you know, see who who's who was a buyer? Uh, do they look like? Uh, do, do do they reflect the reality of the the folks that are buying those kind um, or 
you know, their, their consumer. Um, so it is asking really tough questions and it's about being not only a tough, uh, consumer and demanding those kind of things. Maybe it's you writing, um, you know, if, if you're, you're like me and the kids are like, I still want to buy it, you know, it's buying it. And then, you know, sending a message saying, we hope you continue to do this, or it's, um, sending a letter beforehand and saying, I hope you continue to do this. This is important. Thank you. I see you. I recognize it. I hope it continues. Um, so it's not sitting in that feeling of helplessness. It's putting action and movement to uh, what you want to see. And Giovanni said, thank you. I totally agree. It's almost literally a catch-22 with making uh, cultura and communities pop for the month or week. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Before I was going to piggyback off of, of something that V has said, um, but I wanted to get Giovanni's comment in. Um, <clears throat> Z, when you were talking about um, businesses and that it taking so long for businesses to come and, and grow and be, you know, it takes a long time. And Sonia, you had said um, that there was, it took, it took them 15 years, um, the other, the business. And I, I, the reason why I, I wanted to say something and I didn't want to lose the other question was um, Sandra's on, which, <laughs> so Sandra, so I've been doing this for, for 13 years. This is a long time. Um, and coming from a place that no one really knew what a Black Latina was or an Afro Latina was, they didn't really have a word for it or a name, or if they did have it, they didn't, or they knew or they didn't. And then there was issues within the community in the sense that, to me, when you look at Aisha and you look at Sonia, they're my sisters. They're different because one is actually in part African-American and one is, doesn't have a parent that's considered like an African-American, she's all Caribbean. But to me, I couldn't create a company that had a separation. And so there is a, there is a separation in the terms. Yes, an Afro-Latina is a woman where a person that's from the African diaspora, right? Where a person who is part black and part Latina is different. But to me, we're all in the same umbrella. And that was very hard to push that topic and to push that agenda because I get reamed all the time by Afro-Latinas because of that. They feel that it's wrong to use, to have an umbrella. But it took years to get it up and running. And so in 2008, I have a show, we sell out in New York City. And I take a picture, you know, the show sells out. I take a picture with this woman and I'm happy that she comes. And she says she drove all the way down from Boston to see this show because it was the first time, blah, 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 blah. Now we're in 2021 and Sandra is sitting here. <laughs> but it just goes to show that, you know, it takes time and you got to just keep it going. And what's true to your heart and your soul feels good all the time. And if it's really what you feel and it's really for the culture and you really know what you're doing and this is what you really want, it's always going to propel. It's always going to make sense and be right. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Go. <laughs> um, so one, thank you, Crystal. I love this space. And I hosted a vision board party earlier. So that's why I was late. And it's, I swear there's just no accidents the way life pans out. Cause I was like, am I gonna be able to make this or not? And when I came on and Sonia was speaking about fitting in and it was just like, I hear both of you so loudly because you know, my father was Jamaican and my mother is Panamanian. And I, I'm the only child, I'm the only of all of, of, from wherever, I'm the only one born in the United States for my siblings and everything. So what flag do I wave? And when do I wave it? And then I speak Spanglish and my cousin's like, I don't play with that. So when I found um, 
this when my friend found this play and she's she was in new york she said you'd love theater and it's this black latina play i thought it was amazing but to our conversation today sonia you know that that piece on where do i fit in and what am i and how do i get called you know um I've written several children's books and the, you know, I, in the, the Latino book awards and when my book, the magical day won, and I remember standing up to give the speech, it was like, there are no children's books that have dark skinned children on them. Not a one that says they're Latino. And in fact, or Latinx. And in fact, it was really crazy because I remember somebody saying, oh, that person's too dark to be that for your cover. And so it's like, wow. So I really hear you about being in that space. And, and I, I hear it, you know, feel it and say, we're all, we're together in it from wherever we are. And Crystal, however, you know, somebody asked me the other day for an answer. <laughs> Do you prefer Afro Latina or Black Latina? I said, I don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. Yeah. you know, the fact that you're claiming it for me is the is where I'm really looking at. Yeah. And Aisha, I love, okay, so we need to talk. Yeah. Where are you? You know, you're in Boston. I grew up in Boston. I, I live outside of Boston now. I'm in Millis, Mass. Okay. Okay. So I I'm off of Dorchester. You're still in Dorchester. I grew up in. I'm in DC right now, but I was raised in Dorchester. Feels okay. Cool. I know you. I, I know Dorchester, and okay. uh, I grew up on Blue Hill Ave, on yeah, one yeah. of the right across from Franklin Park. There are three big houses. When the carnival went down, my father would wet down the stairs so that people wouldn't sit on his stairs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my God. But, um. I love the whole thing about the travel mm -hmm. and you know traveling to learn. My, and it was funny because I don't know if it was Sonia or Aisha who said it about it wasn't Vogue, you know, I'm older. So it wasn't Vogue to speak Spanish. It was, you needed to assimilate. And my mom made us all learn, you know, we had to learn French in school because that was culture. Mm -hmm. And I didn't learn, I didn't really start to learn Spanish till I went off to college and majored in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And then I've, I've lost most of it, you know, and when I'm around my Panamanian relatives and they're like, oh, that Spanglish, whatever, won't, won't cut it, right? You know, they're like, you need to, you know, you need to get on the ball. Mm -hmm. and. I really, uh, that one of the goals I put on my vision board for this year is to mm -hmm. go back and really truly call myself bilingual and fluent and, mm -hmm. and stop telling people I speak Spanglish. Because that's, if you ask, anybody asked me, I said, no, I speak Spanglish. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Spanglish is a true language and I am proficient. So <laughs> I really want to, I found your travel site Mm -hmm. But I didn't find your, you said your, your Bella Negra. I didn't see that on Instagram to follow or on. So if you could put those in the chat, because I want to connect on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram with all of you. And the last thing, and then I'll shut up. Um, you asked about mentors. Yes. What? Okay. Put it out into the universe. Mm -hmm. You said you want to mentor. What is, what? be more specific. I also coach for a living. Okay. So what, when you are just say, I want a men, uh, mentor is like saying, you know, I want to go on, I want to go on a trip without a GPS. So you need to tell us, you have all of us sitting here saying, I, what kind of mentor are you looking for? So maybe somewhere in here, one of us can help you. If not us, find somebody to help you on your dream. Cause I'm, I mean, you girls, you ladies are magnificent and I am promoting your dreams the best way with my own. So I would, you know, if whatever mentor you're looking for, let's help you find that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and let's all partner together to find it, to, to support each other, masterminding, even within each other, we can all grow. So I'm shutting up now. Oh, no. Love it. Love it. <laughs> so it's funny. I have not. I've gone on and off camera. 
Z, <laughs> my cousin, <laughs> my cousins. We're both first generation American. Our both our parents, my my parents and her parents are Panamanian. <laughs> and I was raised in that same environment um, where we were to assimilate. So we did not learn to speak Spanish because when my mom moved here um, and my grandmother was actually here first, our grandmother was, it, well, well, something, whatever, it's all confusing. <laughs> whatever. My grandmother was here first. Um, one of the things that she told my mom was they're going to be confused. So my mom surrounded the house in English. My mother did not speak English, but the TV, everything that Aisha said to do to kind of like learn Spanish is what my mom did in the house to make sure that we heard English and absorbed English. And so just like Sandra, I am, I understand it. Everyone could speak. I'm good. I know what's going on around me. I'm, I'm good, but my gringo Spanish is just, you know, it just is what it is. And um, so I didn't, you know, I don't speak because I speak if I have to. Now you're not going to throw me in Mexico and think I'm going to get stranded, not eat, not get home, not find my hotel. I'm going to get, I'm <laughs> good. I'm going to be good, but I don't speak because I feel like I don't sound the way I'm supposed to sound. Exactly. Yep. I don't for that reason. And it's not about not understanding what's going on around me. It's not any of that. And we really start, my parents use Spanish as a way to talk in the house so we wouldn't know what was going on as children. It was a way to stay out of grown folk business. So they <laughs> speak Spanish so we could stay out of grown folk business. And then when we got to high school, we started translating everything. So then my parents would be speaking and we would start chiming in. Cause now I know what you're saying and no, you're wrong. Cause that's not what I did. And that's not what I said. And they were like, oh, wait a minute. You understand? Yes, I understand. Cause I've been hearing all these words my, all my whole life but you ain't tell me what they meant. So, you know, I translate, I don't think in Spanish. I hear Spanish and I translate, or I think in English and translate to Spanish. And I also went to um, heydoctorcourt.com. I saw that you have a class that is called <laughs> Viva la Lengua Spanish for Heritage Speakers. <laughs> That's y'all. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure when your next session is because this is 2020 and I know you're having some issues but you definitely have someone here who's interested and i live in maryland because i know you said you're in dc yeah yeah right yeah. so yeah. that's my story as you're talking, i'm like <laughs> I'm thinking like crystal we got to connect because i would like to do just in this room from what we've heard maybe doing a special course for black latina movement um for heritage speakers <laughs> absolutely outside of hate art well it's hate art court but outside of hate doctor court um yeah. brain absolutely. when i get quiet like this my brain is turning. yes yes definitely, uh, definitely. well since, since everybody else is telling their story i guess i'll take a couple minutes and tell mine um i'm yeah, very so similar wait, before you begin anna okay so okay. anna does have her t-shirt line and in the spirit of collaborating we're yes, gonna do a yes, giveaway yes of mm -hmm. one of the keys to someone in the group today. Um, yes. Go ahead. Yes. So um, so my my um, line is called Love My Brown Skin, just as it implies. We all are different shades and, you know, love. we're all sisters. We're all together. Um, it's really for Black women from across the diaspora because usually the term Black is incorrectly used to imply African-American. And that's, we all make that mistake. We all just sort of talk like that. And I really wanted to expand it to say, you know, no matter where you're from, um, if you're black, you're black, you know, and own that and love it. And so lovemybrownskin.com is, is my site. And um, 
you know, I did just start it. It's been going, you know, pretty good, growing, trying to still work and, and, and do this. Um, I'm really trying to focus all my energies on it. So, um, you know, so that's my little story of, of my business. And I wanted to say, Jacqueline, since you inspired me to to, uh, <laughs> to um, tell my story that's very, very similar to yours, I wanted to gift you a T-shirt on if you go to the website and just pick a T-shirt. I, I, I was originally going to do this one love my brown skin dot com with with the Africa, but you can pick any shirt on the site and um I'm going to let's see I'm gonna put my i g on here so you could message me my name is Anna. you could message me and we could get your information that's my i g okay, so congratulations Jacqueline <laughs> Thank you. That's amazing. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, I think that's amazing. Thank you for doing that. I, I, I actually think um, one of the things that we should all get in the habit of is, is when we're asking a question, do a quick intro of who you are, you know, because you don't know who is in the room, right? You know, so say, hi, I'm Sonia Smith Kong. I am founder of Mixed Up Clothing. Um, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. Maybe that little elevator pitch thing, you know, 15 mm -hmm. seconds, cut it down and just go into your, I'd like to ask Dr. Court a question. You know what I mean? So that people that yeah. are, I think that's one of the things. Or if you're not comfortable with that, drop it in comments yeah. and let folks as they're reading. Um, but I think, as as founders as business owners you know we're not always good at promoting ourselves yeah good um there is maybe a, there could be a piece of imposter syndrome i am guilty of that as well uh but so it's it forces me to kind of get out of you know my own head and and get out there because you don't know as as sandra said who is on this call and who is you know in the room that could help you piece together the person that you are looking for so absolutely and you know just one quick thing about promoting ourselves we are so used to waiting for others to promote us mm -hmm. and you know like you said waiting for the, you know, now people are calling you and when you were sitting there begging for them and nobody would call. And my former career um, in 2008, I got laid off from a big nonprofit. And that's when I did my whole shift of career. And I was a nonprofit director and raised a lot of money. And I tell everybody, nobody ever wanted to talk to me. So I'm used to calling people all the time. And, you know, the one thing I tell people even now is talk about your business, you know, Z talk, you know, when you were even just saying it, even add more energy, like, well, you know, I'm not really trying to make money. No, yes. You know, like I interview the most amazing people and I have started to grow my business and I'm on with all you fabulous women and I'm picking your brains. How can you help me be proud about it? Talk about it. Like when you fall in love, you tell that you, you, irritate your family by telling <laughs> and your friends by saying you know so and so he gave me this and i'm you know and i got this and they're so wonderful and blah 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 talk about your business the way you first fell in love and that you fall in love with it so other people can fall in love with it for you yeah absolutely <laughs> Any, any other questions or comments, ladies? Well, I'll just say real quick, I was going to um, piggyback on, on what Jacqueline said. I, I grew up in a, a, a household with two Dominican parents. They both, you know, spoke Spanish fluently. I am first generation in this country. I have two older brothers. They were both born in St. Martin because my father did a whole tour of the Caribbean working. And he wound up in Newark, New Jersey, and that's when I was born. So I'm the only U.S. born member <laughs> of my family. Um, and I think what happened with me is my parents, you know, they didn't speak English. So they wanted us to 
assimilate and to become Americanized. And they did a very good job of, about that. And then by maybe when we, you know, when I turned 13, then they started pushing Spanish on me. I'm like, well, it's too late now. You know, you wanted me to be Americanized. I'm Americanized. I have no accent. You know, people don't know that I'm Dominican unless I tell them or unless they see my family and my parents because everybody in my family speaks Spanish. And I speak Spanish too, but it's very broken. You know, I'm like Jacqueline. I'm a, I'm a survive, best believe, and I can communicate, but, you know, I don't have that fluidity like, <laughs> you know, like my my relatives do. And I definitely want to want to get there. But, um, you know, it's funny that my daughter who grew up with me, a Dominican who didn't speak Spanish, and then her father who's African-American, she speaks Spanish just as well as I do now because she taught herself in college. She took every advanced Spanish class. She talks to my parents in Spanish. I don't even talk to my parents in Spanish as she does because she really wanted to learn. So it's definitely something that you have to be motivated to do. And she's, you know, very motivated to do that. Um, so it's just, it's funny how many of us have like similar stories because you know, my parents didn't speak English. They taught themselves, you know, just by being in the country. And all three of her, you know, my, um, me and my two brothers, we <coughs> all speak some level of broken Spanish, but we all can survive. And, you know, it's much harder to learn as an adult versus, you know, sort of being raised with it as a kid. I applaud those families that say, no, you're going to speak Spanish in the household because when you go out there, you're going to speak English all day. So when you home, you're going to speak Spanish. And my parents didn't do that. And, you know, at 13, it was a little harder to kind of force it upon us. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, it's a quite interesting thing to now be 45 and, you know, trying to improve my Spanish <laughs> versus doing it when I was younger. But it's never too late. I'll say that. And that's the one thing with my youngest sister. She's 16 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And that's when my parents decided, oh, we messed up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so her, she couldn't even get a glass of juice unless she asked for it in Spanish. The See little, that? little baby was just running around the house hungry because <laughs> she didn't speak Spanish. Because of the yeah. You know, so she's bilingual and the rest of us is, you know, we can get by. Right, we can get by, right. <laughs> you have some students here for your next <laughs> Yeah, <course>. girl. <laughs> you have people here who want to travel. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to add Panama to your list of places to go. Or <laughs> and DR, and DR. <laughs> PR, PR. Uh, I'm repping for PR. Yes. I saw yeah. you had a web uh, candle, so yes. that's uh, yes. 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 Um, yes. There we go. If I could just, uh, you know, I know we're we're closing up, and um, but I just there there was something in there that I just wanted. I keep hearing us kind of almost apologize and and feel like, you know, we don't add up to to what folks think, you know an Afro-Latina or, or, or anybody in the Latinidad, you know, looks like, or even me, as far as the African uh, diaspora, um, it's hard being identity policed and, you know, and, and I, and I, I want to just say, I hear you. I, I feel as my, you know, um, I don't know, there's, there's something about wanting to feel connected and not you know, being heard. And so I want to say, I hear you and I, I value your shares and the fact that um, it's imperative that we become and, and keep on with our, our mission because these stories need to be told. You know, um, there's, there's, there's strength in these shared experiences. And I feel better hearing that there's so many similar folks who have have had that same experience of feeling like they're not enough or they're not, you know, and we're, we're saying, but my, you know, my family, you know, they couldn't talk me, whatever it is. And it, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard when you're, you're just trying to find somebody who understands and I do. And so I just want to say, thank you. Um, I didn't know how much I needed today. So 
too. <laughs> no, it's awesome because I think, like you said, we get policed so much. And so we don't get the freedom to just be in our skin, to be, you know, Black Latinas, to be, whether you speak Spanish or whether you don't, whether you're light skin, whether you're dark skin, whether your hair is curly, whether your hair is coarser, wh whatever it is, um, it doesn't take away from your experience and your identity that you still can uh, relate to your sister. You can relate to any of the women in the group. Um, that doesn't take that away. <clears throat> I don't speak Spanish and yet I hold a whole company called Black Latina Movement. <laughs> so, and you can't take that away from me. You know, I feel, you know, my, I feel my culture within me. I live my culture. And I think that the minute that we allow that freedom to kind of just be who we want to be and who we know we are, it doesn't change anything. And I, th I think that's the kind of idea, not to get so like conspiracy theorists, but it's the idea of divide and conquer. If I can divide these two women from believing that they're not sisters, I've already created, I, I, that's the master plan. And I think that, um, you know, the more that we see this with each other and we understand our commonalities, I think that's what makes us so much more powerful as opposed to seeing our differences. Whether you're, you know, whether you're a, you know, black Mexican, you know, in LA or you're a beautiful Cuban Afro-Latina in Cuba, there's still gonna be some type of commonality in the sense that people don't think you're the same, but you are. Your location differences is what makes you different. And there'll be little differences in your experiences, but there'll be a lot of things that'll be the same. And I think that's really what drives us all as a community and what should continue to drive us. I would just add like, I get the flip. So I speak Spanish mm -hmm. in my first language and it's still like, ¿Dónde tú aprendiste español? ¿Por qué tú hablas español? It's always that questioning, like, Mm -hmm. But you're really black. It's like, yeah, I am. I got locks too. Like, mm -hmm. it. You're gonna get it from either side, <laughs> yeah. regardless. Um, yeah. And I will share since we're sharing stories. We got a little bit of time. Um, before we got started, I was sharing with um, Crystal and Sonia in my own family. My mother and my uncle that came from Cuba. They spoke Spanish, um, so their kids learned Spanish. So I learned Spanish. My two younger uncles. Um, my grandmother moved from Boston to Georgia when they were born and they made the deliberate decision not to teach them English, uh, not to teach them Spanish, excuse me, because it would be easier for them to be black. This was in the seventies. So even within families, you have that kind of division. Um, and then growing up, luckily my mom spoke Spanish, my dad spoke Spanish and French. So language was just there. And then the community we were in, in Boston, Dorchester, as you know, Sandra is is Cape Verdean, it's Jamaican, it's Puerto Rican, it's Cuban, it's Costa Rican, everything's there. The church I went to is a rarity, but it was all black Latinos. So I didn't even realize, like I would see Telemundo, but I'm like, well, that's not my world. In my world, everybody who speaks Spanish is black. And it's not until you go to school and they ship you out to the suburbs and you're like, hmm, this doesn't make sense but it's like, you're the one that doesn't make sense to their world, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so having the strong, I'm glad that I had that foundation in those early years because being in the suburbs for primary school was, if I didn't have that, it would have been very confusing, very jarring, very, very, it would have broken down a lot, you know? Um, so everybody has a story. And again, language is a piece, but it's a small piece. If you want it, we can help you get it. But that's not, as you said, um, it's not the defining piece of your life. We all have shared different experiences, how we come into this space, how we come into our identity, how we experience our identity. And that is what's most important, I think. That there's a range, there's a gamut. There isn't one defining experience of Afro-Latinidad. Yeah. So true, so true. I love it. Well, ladies, I really want to thank everyone. Did everyone sh uh, share in the chat how we all can follow each other, how we can all support each other? I just want to make sure it's there in the chat. And Sonia, you I put all everybody. In your business, right? You put all your um, business information in there. Aisha, you put all your businesses in there as well, right? 
Yeah, I'm gonna write down some of these, so don't close it yet. <laughs> no, 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 I'll keep it. I really wanna thank you guys for joining us for the Black Latina Summit Buying Black. Uh, it was very important that we have these conversations and we continue to have these conversations. We see the importance of our community and that we are the culture, we are the creators of culture. Um, it's us. I, you, can't, you can't deny that. We're so powerful and we have so much to give the world. And um, why not be in charge of that? and not let them rape us. Let us be the ones that we push our culture and they stop stealing it and we push it ourselves and we we give it to the world the way that we seem fit to give it to the world. I don't wanna learn you know, Spanish from a white man. I wanna learn it from someone that looks like Aisha. I don't wanna buy clothing from people who are just making millions of dollars off of their names like Prada and Gucci. I want to buy clothing from someone who looks like me, like Sonia, and <clears throat> give that to my kids. And the minute that we change our thought processes and the minute that we realize the value in our own people, that's when we'll really start to see the change. So I thank you all for sharing this Saturday with me. And we continue to keep this going. Let's all follow each other and keep each other's businesses alive and growing, reposting. And I will see you all very soon. Thank you, Crystal, for putting it all together. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.